You are listening to a recording of the annual Bob O'Neill lecture. This year, Hitoshi Tanaka is talking about security in Northeast Asia. Copyright in these lectures is either owned by the ANU or a third party who has licensed the ANU to use it. Students may use the recording for personal. Study only. No lecture may be communicated online, copied or shared without the prior permission of the ANU. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, a very, very significant uh, pleasure for me to be able to speak uh, in front of you, in particularly Bob O'Neill, uh, or shall I say, old acquaintance of mine. I uh, spent uh, two years in Oxford, uh, where he was a distinct professor, and I spent one whole year as research associate in WIWS in London, IISS. He was director and chairman of it. So <laughs> he was a very distant giant for me. So thanks very much uh, for this uh, invitation to speak at uh, this uh, beautiful place. And again, my added thanks to ANU, because I had been chased by all the media in Japan <laughs> uh, as to this uh, uh, bilateral uh, summit between the DPRK and the United States, because I am one of the rare species on the earth who spent one whole year negotiating with North Korea, leading to the Japanese Prime Minister Koizumi Junichiro's trip to North Korea in 2002. All those journalists rushed to me asking, how is the negotiation with North Korea? Is there anything you can say about the, the possible denuclearization uh, negotiated uh, between the two nations? I will talk about this question of Korean Peninsula later on, but uh, before I do so, I'd like to talk about a little bit broader picture uh, of East Asia, uh, Northeast Asia security over two decades. Uh, when I talk about East Asia security, I all the time talk about the past, because we need to learn from the past experiences. And if we go back to the period of, say, 150 years ago, uh, as you may know, Japan was opened up by the visit of Commodore Perry of the United States. That was 1853. And Japan fought the war only 40 years after that. Japan defeated China. And 40 years since then, Japan did fight again China. Japan was indeed rapidly rising power in the region. China was a declining power. So this is what did happen. But Japan was defeated by coalition of allies led by the United States. And after the war, Japan did rise again, but thanks to the, all the setups, the Japanese uh, <coughs> rise was very much peaceful. Japan was focused on the one specific goal, that is to make the significant contribution to the establishment of the uh, liberal international order part of the West, part of G7 process. Japan was lucky in a sense because Japan, uh, Japanese rise was under the Japanese constitution, very much pacifist constitution and also in the framework of US-Japan security alliance. Japan did not give any threat to the rest of the world. Therefore, when Japan <coughs> has risen 
the region of East Asia was more or less relaxed. And again, for Japan, the period starting from 1972, when China-Japan relations were normalized, that was in 1972, and up until 2010, when Japan was surpassed by China in terms of GDP. That period of time was the happiest for Japan's relations with China. So uh, now we see China rising rapidly. And Xi Jinping talks about 2049 as the target year for becoming the most powerful, most richest nation in the world as a modern, strong socialist party. This, again, is amazing because, as I said, 2010, Japan was surpassed in terms of GDP by China. But eight years since then, China is 2.5 times as big as Japan. In nine, the late nine, 19, 1980s, when I was operating as the head of trade division with the United States, Japan was sort of occupied about 50% of US, uh, US uh, uh, I mean, United States ran a very <coughs> huge deficit in trade with Japan. 50% of their deficit was with Japan. At that time, at that time, the, uh, yeah, Japan's trade with the United States occupied about 30% of total Japan's trade worldwide. At that time, China was only 6%. But now, China occupies about 22% of Japan's total trade uh, worldwide. United States declined to 15.15%. So it is abundantly clear that our interdependency with China has grown tremendously. And that would become true <coughs> into the future as well. The, but yet, we have concerns. We have concerns. Because, again, we see various activities on the part of China. There, there is a strong concern about the Chinese orientation into the future. But at the same time, as I said, there has been the history of the conflict between rising power and declined power. This time, very clearly, Japan is a declining power. China is a rapidly rising power. But this time, all these two factors taking place under the background of uncertain United States, uncertain United States. We have seen United States as a source of leadership in the international community. But if you look at the current orientation of the United States under President Trump, I all the time thought of the U US leadership consisted of four dimensions, military, economic, agenda-making capability, and as a model of democracy. Where is US leadership today? The military leadership is more or less in question. For instance, this is very typical of President Trump. He said in Singapore to Kim Jong-un of North Korea that the United States decides to stop the military exercises with South Korea. That may be necessary, but yet he did say so without any serious consultation with South Korea. I mean, 
It sounds crazy. And I am not entirely sure if Trump, President Trump has the perception of, you know, how and what the alliance means to the United States. He, for instance, applies the uh, tariff measures citing the national security clause in the Trade Expansion Act on steel, aluminum, and he said that he's planning to do so on automobile. And <laughs> Japan, as one of the important allies for the United States, is targeted. He may say that this is a trade issue, but yet there's no sort of deep consideration about how the alliance uh, is significant for the United States. So I, this is one of the elements. The economic leadership is gone. The economic leadership of the United States is obviously consisted of his, I mean, the US strong desire for free trade mechanism. But now it appears to, be, to have gone. The agenda-making capability of the United States is trying to get rid of all the agenda <coughs> the previous president had established. The Paris Agreement, TPP, the nuclear agreement with Iran, the, all the economic arrangement with NAFTA and all sorts of things. And he decides to move the uh, embassy from the, uh, I mean, the embassy to Jerusalem in Israel, which will obviously create huge <coughs> conflict in that region. And it will have a long-term impact on the future of the Middle East stability. So I do not see any new agenda created by the United States. The United States under President Trump. And is anyone in this room say that America is now a very good model of democracy? Probably not. So we see the US leadership worldwide being undermined. That is going to be true in East Asia as well. So we see, we see rising China very rapidly, declining Japan, and uncertain US. There is an argument if Trump, President Trump, is the cause of everything, cause of the, uh, the loss of leadership on the part of the United States internationally. But I don't think so. President Trump is not cause, origin of this the decline, decline leadership on the part of the United States. He may be a symptom of a long-term tendency of inward brokenness on the part of the United States. So we may say that this tendency may prolong even after Trump. I wish he would leave, he would leave sooner than normal, <laughs> but uh, we don't know. And even after Trump, we may see a new president who has a you know, similar uh, orientation like Trump, inward rootiness type thing. So this is the very simplistic, but this is a picture up until 2050 when China claims that China would become the most prosperous nation of the world under communist rule and Japan, unfortunately, would not be able to grow as China does. And America, quite uncertain. The question to you, question to you, what should we be doing to cope with that type of situation? This is this is the very clear and pressing agenda for us. Fortunately, I think, and probably some of you think, that we have the common interest. 
in coping with that situation. I understand that China is a very promising market for you, but at the same time, you have some trouble. Because look at this uh, situation currently existing in China. Xi Jinping clearly has consolidated his power and authority by getting rid of the term limit of the presidency. And he says that, again, he would like to open up, further open up Chinese economy, open and reform policy in economic field. But at the same time, <coughs> he talks about much stronger intervention by the central authority of communist into economy and also society. The question we must be asking to ourselves, is it compatible? Is it compatible? Is the growth needed for China to become the most prosper prosperous nation in the world? They probably need around 6% growth rate and they will pursue open reform economic policy. But at the same time, they would like to see much stronger grip on the part of communists regarding the economic life and also the social life as well. Is it compatible? I don't think so. I don't think so. The third element Xi Jinping talks about is a question of what we call China dream. China dream is very, very strong component of nationalism. We all know. And China often talks about the 150 years of humiliation that started from the loss of opium war, the loss of in the uh, Sino-Japanese war. Uh, and this clearly Chinese dream <coughs> is to go back to the period of glory of China. If we look at the current situation of the strong expansion of influence through road and belt, belt and road initiative, and also the activities in South China Sea. We wonder what is going to happen. China clearly acquiring confidence. China is trying to be much more active in international affairs. And that is taking place against the U.S. losing dignity in the world. So, uh, question, again, I come back to that question, how to deal with the situation. I have several re recommendations to make. Again, you can't deny the fact we all are going to be more dependent on China. That's good, in a sense. If China try to change themselves. If China becomes a constructive entity in the international community, that, that is all fine. But yet we are not entirely sure about it. So my recommendation, the first recommendation is to expand uh, national defense capability. The US will probably be no longer in the mood of spending all that money for the protection of Japan, of Europe, and all sorts of things. There is a need for us. I mean, I am not saying that we should depart from the alliance relationship with the United States. That remains to be the case. We, we do not. We don't have a nuclear capability, and we will not be acquiring nuclear capability in the future. And again, we, the, I mean, although the United States is less powerful in terms of the model of democracy, but yet we have the same value. Therefore, this uh, alliance relationship will prolong. No question about it. But yet, under the concept of the alliance, the same thing happened to Australia. I think we would have to be expanding our mission, law and missions. We would have to be spending more 
in the defense capability as well. That's point number one. At the same time, if expanding your defense capability must go along with much stronger security cooperation with countries like Australia, like India, like, like South Korea, ASEAN, and all sorts of things. This is not for the sake of the, you know, containing China. No way. We have no capability to contain China, but security needs to be, uh, needs to be expanded anyway. The second recommendation I make is that still there's a room for us to work for what we call confidence building mechanism, inclusive of China. This is very, very important. We are just launched the system bilaterally with China. But yeah, there is sufficient reason why we will, we will be doing it in region. <coughs> Uh, regionally, either in Northeast Asia or East Asia as a whole. Because, you know, the traditional, non-traditional security such as the, the, the uh, counter-proliferation of mass destruction <coughs> weapons, counter-terrorism, and all sorts of very common interests in the region. That's, I would hope that six-party talks on Korean presence I will be talking about uh, soon may become one of the two for that. We know confidence building mechanism. Third, we should expand uh, cooperative mechanism, regional cooperative mechanism in the field of environment, the energy efficiency, the city planning and all sorts of things. China is getting very, very big. China has a tremendous problem to become a advanced nation of the world. They require very strong cooperation from the rest of the world in terms of the environment technologies, the energy efficient technology and all that. Let us try to promote that type of co cooperation with China. And fourth, we need to have certain leverage vis-a-vis -vis the United States. United States mm -hmm. try to take every, everything uh, granted. We need to have uh, our own leverage so that we can tell to the United States this is the way we would like to proceed in this region of East Asia. I'm talking about such things like TPP then. Australia and Japan needs to work much harder to make sure that TPP would become the key component of liberal trade in the region. I think we should include China. We should include Taiwan. We should include all those countries. We tell to the US, look at this. This is a wish on the part of the region. Why don't you come around to join? We need to promote the uh, the East Asia uh, free trade mechanism as well. The RCEP, that's we need to be doing uh, in a much sort of prompt way. That would become the leverage for us against the US. That's type of the resilience needs to be strengthened in this region. And for that, Australia and Japan has very clear common interest. And I would very much like to work together with Australia to create a kind of design to cope with the situation that is impossible situation rising China, declining Japan, and uncertain United States. We have the common interest. Let me uh, speak about Korean Peninsula. Uh, I am actually I'm the first Japanese who were briefed from the U.S. intelligence community about the possible development of nuclear weapon. That was in 1989, 30 years ago. I was director in charge of Korean Peninsula. And uh, that was said to be, I mean, that year was said to be the initiation of North Korean nuclear development. 30 years have passed. And we had 
at least two occasions in which North Korea promised that they would stop nuclear development, they would get rid of nuclear devices, denuclearization. They promised twice. In 1994, uh, we decided to provide light water reactors, two of them. America said to us, you and Korea should pay everything. And I said, no. I was personally in charge. I said, no, never, ever. So <laughs> it turned out to be three countries, United States, Japan, Korea, dividing the cost. Well, that's roughly equal. That's 1994. And 2005, we had six-party talks. By the way, six-party talk, talks is the product of Japan. I negotiated with North Korea when Prime Minister went to North Korea in 2002. We had a lengthy discussion on everything. It's not just abduction. It's not just abduction, which the current administration of Japan talks all the time. I say to them, if you are to talk about abduction, you should find the right solution to that. For that, you need to talk to North Korea not talk to the United States, asking the US to take care of the issue, to make a direct, uh, I mean, it's pity. But yet, uh, yet uh, sooner or later, Japan would have to be doing it, direct talk to North Korea. But at that time, we talked about all type of thing, and we wanted to have it on the what we call Pyongyang Declaration of 2002, the establishment of six-party talks. But at that time, we had no groundwork made vis-a-vis -vis the US, vis -vis China, vis -vis Korea. So we left it just, you know, lingering. But one and a half years since then, we established, we were able to establish six-party talks. And 2005, there was the statement, joint statement made by six-party talks that North Korea will in a verifiable way to get rid of nuclear devices, nuclear problem. We arbitrate, obviously. And we felt, and you felt, that this time, the Trump, President of the United States, and new leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, may agree upon what we call com complete, verifiable, irreversible, denuclearization, CVID. And we all expected that sort of language will appear on the agreement. Nothing in that agreement. Nothing in that agreement. No concrete. Uh, I was arguing that there is a need for a very serious commitment on the part of North Korea for denuclearization. This is the right timing for North Korea to do that, but it, it, it was not appearing on the document. And there is no concrete roadmap for denuclearization. So this is very many people, even in the United States, in Korea, say that this is an empty document. And this summit has not uh, been successful. I happen to have a different view. I happen to have a different view. I disagree to almost all the policy attitude on the part of President Trump regarding very many issues, but not this one. The approach the joint statement has taken precisely trust first approach. The document talks about the need to establish mutual trust. And alongside with that mutual trust, let's go ahead with denuclearization. Let's go ahead with provision of security to North Korea. This is the right approach. In the past, in Japan, United States, even Australia must have talked that since North Korea has been violating all the international norms. Let's see the CBID first from North Korea. Then we shall think about the 
you know, easing sanctions, we think about provision of security, we think about normalization with North Korea. It didn't work. This is precisely the approach we took when we organized Japanese Prime Minister's trip to North Korea. Please, please read the document we produced uh, in Pyongyang in the form of Pyongyang Declaration in 2002. Similar language talks about the need for establishing trust relationship and let's deal all those pending issues with sincerity, with goodwill. That is, and you may not have an experience in talking to North Koreans. I had 25 sessions of negotiations with North Korea utilizing all weekend. Weekends, my wife was complaining about <laughs> my disappearance, <laughs> honestly. But that was state secret, state secret. I sort of leave my house around 10 o'clock on Saturdays and <laughs> coming back Monday. <laughs> Wait a minute, my wife says, where is your lover's home? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But yet, you know, 10 hours each session, 25 times. It's a long, this, I am the only person who spent that amount of time negotiating with military general, military intelligence general of North Korea. So, but yet, knowing the history of North Korea, knowing the history of the Korean Peninsula, they were under the constant pressure from the powers in the region. Russia, China, Japan. And they are, they have very specific mentality vis-a-vis -vis the large powers like the United States. I spent the whole negotiations, hours with the US in trade. They all the time come from somewhere uh, very high, you know, <laughs> ready to bash you because they have power, they have power. But again, this type of approach doesn't work vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. And our objective is not creating a new type of relationship. Our objective is to create good relationship, but for that we need denuclearization and improvement of governance on the part of North, North Korea. This, I think, the right approach should be Let's sort of give time for creating a, you know, trust, relationship of trust between two nations. And again, Japan needs to be doing it as well. The Prime Minister yesterday, today, are saying that he would very much like to talk to North Korea. And I think it is very needed. I made a recommendation. I was writing a press article yesterday here in uh, Canberra, recommending the government to help the United States to succeed this process of trust building and denuclearization and security provision. Because we have not much to lose. We have not much to lose by, you know, seeing denuclearization and creating security to them. If North Korea is cheating us, we can all the time go back to the uh, pressure. I, in this strategy is one thing which I all the time talk about, and Bobo Ni is, uh, is full of, you know, strategies, because he was heading IISS so often. I recommend the P3C strategy, P3C, P3C, do you know P3C? That is the Military airplane, reconnaissance airplane, which could identify submarines. I call for the need for introduction of P3C. Pressure is all the time needed. Pressure is imposed. Pr pressure needs to be decreased depending upon the situation. Pressure. But it must be accompanied with three Cs. One, coordination. Without coordination among the key countries like US, Korea, Japan, China, we will not be able to achieve 
the desired result because all the time North Korea make use of the differences among the key nations. So coordination. Second comes contingency planning. Because you never know when North Korea convert themselves to rather militaristic military provocation period of time. We need to be prepared for that, like the how to uh, to uh, cope with the refugees, how to uh, trans transfer Japanese nationals from Seoul to Japan and all sorts of things. We have still about 200,000 North Koreans living in Japan. In Japan, they said to be, they are said to be loyal to North Korean government. We, during the period of that type of military provocation, we must expect uh, a kind of sabotage possible to the atomic establishment or atomic reactors and, and all this. I mean, I'm not talking about the possibility of them doing so. I am talking about the need for preparation. If there were sufficient preparation, you can fend off all this type of military provocation. The third C is communication channel. Communication channel is very needed, in particular with countries like North Korea. We all the time constantly need to tell to them what we think, what the world think. When I was negotiating with North Korea, half of my mission was to let North Korea know what is taking place in the world, what is the decision-making process in the United States. And I sometimes talked about the need for North Korea to make an apology to South Korea in relation to the, the combat which took place on the sea. And they did so. And we talked about the need for North Korea sitting down with the US uh, foreign minister, the Secretary, Secretary of State Dick Powell. He, I'm sorry, Powell, was it? He sat down with North Korean foreign minister based upon uh, my request to North Koreans. So again, there would have to be some type of communication channel, some type of communication channel, all the time existing. And I would very much hope that this Japanese government will do so uh, in, in, in the days uh, since uh, the Singapore summit meeting. So, I am one of the rare person who thinks that this Singapore summit is a success. This is the beginning, beginning of desired process. Obviously, North Korea may cheat, but yet we have tools to make sure that their sort of attitude, if they cheated, <coughs> would have to be you know, responded in a harsh way. So, having said that, I finish my initial remarks, and I would like to have exchange of views. Thanks very much. remarks sits at what I would call the, the pragmatic liberal end of the Japanese spectrum. Um, and I think um, what he's, he's told us about his interpretation of the Korean um, American summit is, is, a, is a new reflection of his very long standing occupation of that end of the spectrum in the Japanese um, debates. Um, it, I know that you will have lots and lots of questions. We do have Lots of time because Tarsan has kindly um, kept his remarks um, short. Uh, if I might um, take the chance for so, and, and, and start, I think kick us off with, with a question briefly. Um, I wondered whether you might be able to pull a little bit the two parts of your talk together and give us some pointers about how we might think about this breakthrough summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un 
Um, in light of the context of us living in a region with declining Japan, rising China, and still an uncertain America, how, how do these three trends yeah. help us to situate, help us understand yeah. what's happening? Very, very important point you are making. The uh, <coughs> success or failure of this process would have to have very huge impact on the future of the region because we all know that unless China cooperate in a very serious way for the denuclearization de process, we wouldn't see a success. Therefore, if this process were to be successful, we would see much constructive relationship between the United States and China. And end of the day, that will involve Japan, Russia, obviously South Korea as well. So you may see a very natural process of confidence building mechanism in Northeast Asia, joined by uh, Northern South Korea, US, China, and Japan, and Russia as well. So, but if this process were to be more or less the same stuff, meaning that the, this process did not result in any success, we would see much harsh relationship between the United States and China, because if you know the national security strategy which was published last December talks about China and Russia as revisionist power, and the United States tell that they would like to cope with it by power. I'm not entirely sure a person like Trump who is good at transactional approach would stick to this strategic constellation of uh, the U.S. State uh, National Security Council and Defense. But yet, given this, the current episode of the trade uh, relationship, and the United States is obviously targeting the high-tech, future high-tech industry in China. So, again, success or failure of uh, this uh, denuclearization process have very significant impact on the security and future of East Asia as a whole. Well, we can hold some thoughts there, but I'd like to, to, to throw this open to, to, to others as well. Um, please indicate for me throughout this with, with, with your, your hand. Um, can I... It, um, invite you to introduce yourself briefly and to keep your comments and questions to, to a minimum so I can receive as many as possible. So, Andy first. Thank you. Um, Andy Spriato, a PhD student here at SDSC. Um, my question is related to the uh, first point that you uh, raised in your presentation that Japan um, changed um, its behavior and, you know, for lack of a better word, identity because of actual external pressure from the United States, both in the mid 19th century and later after the Second World War. Um, and um, I sort of uh, associate that with your first recommendation that Japan needs to build up its military in cooperation with uh, Japan's allies. Um, just why do you think that uh, China would just simply give in to uh, external pressure in the same way that Japan did? That China would just um, uh, try to re restrain its behavior because of uh, the fear of retaliation from Japan. I don't, I don't think China will yield to the strong pressure from the United States. China will obviously try to find their own way to uh, cope with uh, that sort of pressurizing from the US situation. But I think, as I told you, China will have a tremendous problems in relation to their own governance into the future. As I said, China needs economic expansion. China needs the cooperation from the rest of the world. China needs sophisticated technologies to run their nation. You may say that, well, China may not need anything from the rest of the world. I don't think so. But suppose China is trying to strengthen the communistic rule. I mean, it's appalling for me to see all those public intellectuals of China 
who used to speak rather freely, but now they stop shouting, saying anything meaningful. I don't see any future of the advancement of China. If China were to wishing to become the most populous nation in the world, China would have to use external pressure as well for the betterment of their society. I am entirely sure that Chinese communistic rule will be somewhat changed. I, I, I don't believe that China will get rid of their communistic rule, but yet I think there is an improvement in that. And even China needs external pressure to attain the right governance system in their own country. So we will see. Yes. I'm um, a retired tax consultant. Mm -hmm. uh, just a quick question on that is what you say about the North Korean situation. The key point is that uh, for a uh, complete liberalization required the United States simultaneously withdraw troops, signing a peace agreement, and as you say possible suspension of military exercise. But in this country, in Australia, I have heard so many commentaries. They say, no, we can't give it to them. We cannot be trusted, not Koreans. But give me the impression that if you see the frontline state, China, North Korea, South Korea, and Japan, if the war starts, for example, far in theory, and if a missile misguided target into China and Manchuria, what happens? Prepare for World War III. So, would you employ your government? Japan has a very influential government, very influential over in the United States, in over this country too. So, it should actually promote the trust first and work on those things. You can't just step, ask North Koreans to give up everything first before you give anything. That will not work, guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So, I was sincerely hope, would you employ your government to work on Australia? To go on, United yeah. States. Sure. Okay. We don't even think there's no chance of yeah. peace at whatsoever. Good observation. Good observation. But let's think, uh, you know, why, why North Korea is wanting to denuclearize. Nobody expected, and even today, not many people consider North Korea will do that. North Korea will cheat, I think. But yet think about all this. North Korea declared that they became nuclear power last December. And North Korea Kim Jong-un pursued two parallel policies, economic development and nuclear acquisition of nuclear weapons. And now they may argue that they have achieved their nuclear ambition, but yet it's a long way to go for their economic development. That's where they are. And nuclear weapon, as you know, is not usable. And it is very, very costly to maintain their nuclear system. So a person like Kim Jong-un, I mean, it's not surprising if he thought that now North Korea is a nuclear state. Let us use the status of nuclear state as a bargain with the U.S. for the sake of security of North Korea. Very clever of him, very clever. Therefore, his intention may not be denuclearization <coughs> one go. It would be a long process. And it is understandable, given the fact that North Korea maintains very complex nuclear development nuclear system. And Libya, it did take two years, but yet North Korea, I bet that the denuclearization will last at least five years, five years. And during that period, it's absurd for us to say that, well, well, no, you, you, you denuclear yourself first, and we wait five years. No, it won't work, as you say. It will not work. Therefore, 
assuming that North Korea has the real intention to denuclearize themselves, the logic being what I said, North Korea wants to use their nuclear state status as a bargaining chip to receive something big. And we are prepared to give something big because we have the, the um, very real reason to, to normalize our relationship with North Korea because we have not settled the question of the past as well. And I wrote all this, the Pyongyang Declaration, that we, upon the, the normalization of the relationship, we shall give a very significant economic cooperation to North Korea. That is our debate. That is our debate. So, yes, you are right in saying that. It is not feasible for us just to demand denuclearization. We would have to see a kind of simultaneous movement on both sides. We would not like to see war. It is tremendous loss. We have to endure. That is unthinkable. So uh, Hitachi, thank you very much for that extremely interesting and stimulating lecture. Uh, I particularly like your point that the powers of the Western Pacific need to get together and trade thoughts and, and develop policies for what is going to be a very worrying future. It's not like the Cold War uh, where you had a, a regulated structure and fairly guaranteed responses that would be delivered by each side and that exercised a, a big deterrent force. We are now moving into a situation where, as you said, China is, is rising and the United States is becoming much more self-centered. And for us, Japan and Australia and several other countries of the Asian Pacific area, um, that leaves us uh, in, in a very troubling situation. And uh, the only way I think we can deal with it effectively is to get together uh, and first of all pool our thoughts on, on policy uh, and then uh, develop the, the policies themselves. And I'm wondering uh, how you think uh, this idea uh, would be accepted in Japan. Uh, Prime Minister Abe has his own strong views on international policy. Is this likely to, to meet with his approval? Is he, is he going to stay there for much longer and so on. I think from an Australian perspective, I would hazard a guess that this is a, a very saleable proposition. Uh, but no one started selling it as, as yet. Uh, it's very early days. But I think this is a, an idea in which Japan and Australia can play a lead in and bring several other capable, like-minded states in with us. Thank you. I all the time admire your strategic uh, thinking and I completely agree to what you just stated. Uh, I don't think we need an approval by the Japanese Prime Minister. If we were to launch some type of second track or academic uh, discussion, I hope that the new <laughs> will <laughs> provide a venue for this type of thing. Yes, indeed, this is a new situation. In the past, we, may, we might have thought that we need to include the United States as a key part for all this. But yet, what we need to do in a very short period of time is to design what is the important element to uh, lead to a stable East Asia. And for that, again, Think about this. It was joint effort by Australia and Japan. The creation of APEC, the creation of ARF. That's all the efforts on the part of Australia and Japan. And if we were to launch this type of initiative, I mean, the government, I spent 36 years in the government but uh, 
I have a strong feeling in these days that the government, every government is getting very populistic and they do not produce a statesmanship, internationalistic approach. I mean, every country is much more self-centric. Therefore, our public intellectuals, like you and us, needs to get together and come up with a kind of design for the future. For that purpose, I would uh, like to see countries like Japan, Australia, Korea, uh, Indonesia possibly, but not India, because <laughs> <laughs> as you all know, that the Prime Minister Abe and Trump, possibly, are advocating the concept of Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific. It may be a bright idea because he talks about rule-based open ocean. It's very commonsensical. <laughs> Everyone outside Japan considered that this approach is a hedging against China approach. There's no need for us to compete with China, compete with One Belt, One Road initiative by this uh, Indo-Pacific concept. I mean, rule-based, fine, let's do it in a quiet, serious way. But uh, at the same time, we will have to think about future inclusive international community here in this part of the world for that Japan and Australia under the auspices of ANU. <laughs> we can develop our thought. Having planted that seed. <laughs> <laughs> um, it reminds me, Tan san that you know, in, in the last period of the party talks, in which you were obviously involved and very active, um, in the agreement was actually reference to a peace regime <laughs> that, that that would tie in the different elements that, that are involved in, in, in this issue, the denuclearization, the peace settlement, and the finally the Korean War, and ideas of potential reunification between North and South. And this, 2005, of course, uh, was at the time brought up by the Chinese, um, who interpret the peace regime in a particular way, but the, the multilateralization of the eventual peace is not a new idea. Mm -hmm. yeah, and sure. I, I, I think it's a timely moment now to remind everybody that, that you know this, this this has been sort of mooted and sure. in, in the past and, and didn't come to fruition for different reasons. Yeah. But now is maybe a good yeah. time to think about this again. Sure. Um, yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir, for your uh, very insightful talk today. Uh, my name is Michael Young, the first year undergraduate student here at ANU. Uh, so you talked about uh, the importance of contingency planning, and, such as military planning and, uh, and the increasing national defense. Um, I was wondering um, like what kind of contingency planning can be carried out uh, while the negotiation is going on uh, when Donald Trump has promised North Korea that, that he's going to stop quote unquote war games with South Korea. Like if uh, any, to me, anything you do could be seen as a provocation by the North Korea, and if they could just go back to building like ICBMs. So, yeah, what kind of specific things? Thank you. Yes, uh, Trump talked about the military exercises, joint military exercises, as provocative to North Korea. Uh, I mean, I, I think that is a slip of tongue. <laughs> the, uh, I'm sure the United States and South Korea will maintain readiness for any irregular uh, sort of uh, attack or anything from, from North Korea. What I am talking about, uh, the, the continuous building, I was the person uh, partly, partly in charge of this uh, contingency planning in 1994. Uh, it's amazing Japan doesn't have any law whatsoever to, you know, to be cope with the contingency situation. And it's appalling. I mean, there are a couple of things we need to be doing. 
and uh, the couple of things we need to have plans. One, what is the Japanese role in the event of the war in the Korean Peninsula? How to help? I mean, think about this. When North Korea crossed to South Korea, there is going to be a war. And you can imagine that the major portion of the US soldiers are going out from Japan by, you know, airplane and all sorts of things. The United States is supposed to make a prior consultation to the Japanese government because under the treaty obligation, United States were to make consultation with the US in the event that the United States would use their military capability out of Japan, out of the US bases in Japan. So we need to be prepared for that. Without any plan, we cannot support the US. But recent, the uh, new registration to 2015, three years ago, uh, has made Japan to be able to prepare for that type of thing. Two, how to help Japanese nationals in Seoul. We have a very sizable number of Koreans. And I was in charge of all this operation in 1994. And I went to the Japan uh, Transportation Ministry asking them to send a ship. And they said, are you out of mind? All those soldiers, un I mean, the sailors' union wouldn't let the, their ship to go <laughs> when there is an imminent war situation. And I asked the United States to, you know, give lift to Japanese nationals as well. They said, no, 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 because we do not have any agreement. The U.S. says that there is only two agreements for the evacuation of foreign nationals. UK and Canada. So we, since then, we changed our law so that self-defense force could go to help the Japanese nationals to evacuate from the conflicted area. And in my time, I was talking to the South Korean general that in the event of this military strategy, military contingency, we would like to let Japanese self-defense force to go to South Korea for the sake of evacuation operation. And South Korean general said, no way, no way. All those guns and all those uh, artilleries facing up to North Korea would be shifted to the Japanese self-defense force. The lack of confidence, lack of trust relationship, it may be prolonging even today. But yet, when you talk about all this type of contingency, as I said, this denuclearization process would be a long term process, may last five years, 10 years. And US scientists say it will take 15 years. We need to have a preparation in the event that all of a sudden North Korea were to depart from the process of denuclearization. So uh, even for making the contingency planning, you know, it takes time. Japan alone cannot prepare for that. There is a kind of, you know, relationship, sufficient, mutual, the uh, mature relationship between Japan and South Korea needs to be developed. So, uh, yes, uh, President Trump said that this is provocative, let us uh, stop doing this while the constructive negotiation is taking place. I agree. But yet, we can do it in a, sick, in a very quiet way. That is the function of national, national sovereign government. That's uh, what we need to be doing. So hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Oh, Peter Drasley. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Peter Drasley. I know. Thanks very much. You've got a really clear exposition of the strategic uncertainties that we face through Northeast Asia and, and uh, a very sensible 
for recommendations that you make about how uh, we should collectively deal with them. Um, my two-part question touches upon what Evan said in Bob said a moment ago. The first one, the, the North Korean issue, and how that plays into the uncertainties, either exacerbating them or ameliorating them in a significant way. Uh, I think your point about the essential element of success being uh, the framework, the strategic framework for involvement of critical parties, the six-party framework, or something similar to that, uh, is, uh, is really important. The question I have about that is, you know, what signs are there of the United States conceiving of the management of this problem within that kind of strategic framework now. Uh, everything seems to suggest there's, there's not a, a clear conception of that framework. Uh, and uh, the play on the trade war with China, even yesterday, suggests that, uh, for example. So uh, have you any, any signs that uh, that conception of things is accepted as a way to work? And the, and the core question though about uh, you know how we should respond to all this and the four recommendations you have uh, I mean looking from the outside it looks as though uh, the leadership the policy leadership in Japan is iterating towards your four recommendations and that conception of things is getting entrenched in Japan uh, I wonder if you'd share that judgment uh, and on the other side you are your encouraging words about Australia. I mean, tell us frankly what you think about how Australia is playing into this now and whether there's any sign of any strategic conception in Australia that we need to follow your four recommendations. Uh, I, was, I was gathering my thought in relation to your second question. And meanwhile, I forgot your first question. <laughs> but, uh, <coughs> let, me, uh, let me respond to your... This is my joke. <laughs> let me respond to your first question. I do not expect the current U.S. administration will come up right and right concept for the coordination among the countries needed. They are taking bilateral, unilateral approach. And I was talking with one of the former chief of staff of the U.S. White House that under Trump. He said to me, there are two particular nature of Trump. The Trump has a, an excessive attachment to the ownership of decision. Anybody else is supposed to be making decisions. It's me who makes the whole decision. I do not expect him to make sensible decision in relation to the coordination with the rest of the world. He's much more interested in his own way. He's much more interested in America first approach. So uh, I don't expect the US administration today will produce something you talked about. That leads us to act more or less unilaterally as well because we see the design in the joint statement of 2005. They talked about component. As she talked about, there is the phrase of peace regime. But at the same time, they talk about normalization of the relationship between DPRK and US, DPRK and Japan. And people talk about the, the peace treaty, the, de the declaration of uh, the the end of the war type thing. And if you look at all this component, yes indeed, declaration of the end of the war can be made by the four parties, United States, South Korea, North Korea, and China, because they are the ones who fought the war. So uh, like it or not, that's going to be, you know, multilateral type thing. United States, I'm sure, will sort of try to normalize relationship with DPRK because almost all countries have relationship with North Korea. So it's not very difficult for the United States to normalize relationship. I guess that they may be sort of creating liaison office 
before making any formal. I recommend Japan to do the same. Japan, I mean, bilateral renormalization discussions we did have when the Prime Minister went to North Korea. We had the initial session with North Korea. That was suspended because of the question of the this strong uh, public uh, public uh, resentment against abduction and the question of nuclear weapons. Now, I think we should resume this normalization talk. In that discussion, we can have the talk on abduction to come to the settlement of that. Let us think about pragmatically because we cannot expect a very sort of visionary approach from this Trump administration in the United States. Unfortunately, sorry for that. But yet, we must move, you know, in coordination, but yet parallel. The question of the law of Australia, I still, uh, not still, but I have the strong confidence in Australia. To be very honest, the Australia is the only country who can talk about this type of thing. Uh, I don't know this uh, <laughs> the important element is we have hugely rising China. We have the United States which is more inward looking. And our approach, our discussion should be centered upon how to involve the United States and China in a constructive way. As I said, if the denuclearization process of North Korea were to be successful, there may be a natural way for us to talk about wider sort of peace, peace arrangement or the conference building mechanism, but it takes time, as I said. Therefore, meanwhile, if we were to talk about some type of constructive mechanism, it's not excluding the United States, it's not excluding China, but yet, kind of design talk. Who else could Japan talk to except Australia? South Korea possible, but South Korea is very, very busy in this. North. So Australia, India, not India, not Russia, obviously not. So Australia is the important partner for Japan. I'm absolutely sure. We can drop that bombshell. <laughs> Responsibilities on this continent too. Uh -huh. I mean, to take a few more questions. So suddenly everyone's warmed up. There was a whole bevy of hands here. We've got about 12 minutes left. Um, John was next on, on the list. But can I just ask you to show me your hands if you've got a question so that I know how many we've got going. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go first to John um, and then to Paul. And then, if we have time, I will take the rest in the group oh, sure, please and do. offer you a smallest word, yeah. which you may or may yeah, not You will class. remember that yeah. question <laughs> for me. Yeah. Okay, I'll try. <laughs> but, but, but the thing is, we'll take John, John and Paul from this corner first and then walk to the middle. Okay. And if, if you could keep them short, this will ensure that everyone can ask the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we've seen uh, President Trump, when he was in the campaign, talked about a, a fairly isolationist view of the world, America first. He's, he changed, he seemed to change in his first year. Um, there's a view now emerging that he's looking to perhaps go back on that, to go back to his policy views of 2016. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, perhaps, perhaps see America's role as offshore balancing, mm -hmm. getting off the continent, getting out of Korea. The end of the war seems to point to a prospect of a dissolution of UN command, which has obviously a footprint in, China, in Japan. Um, what's your read of that? And what's your sense of what the implications are for Japan and the bombshell? Do you think that that means Japan would go nuclear? Okay, that, that, that's, that's quite a lot there. Would, would you like yeah, to take sure, that first? Sure. I think Trump has changed his, uh, at least his, uh, the uh, precise policies. Uh, 
And he has a reason for this, because I think he is very, very severely encircled uh, politically because of this Russia gate. And he is desperate, in a sense, in buying votes for the midterm election. And think about all this, the, the departure from Paris Agreement for the sake of coal miners in Virginia, the depart from TPP, the gain votes from the auto union, the uh, Jerusalem thing for the Christian, uh, and the Iran deal, the strong conservative uh, anti-Iran sentiment in the Congress. And you can, you know, account everything for this, his success, the success of the Republican Party in the coming midterm election. Uh, so this is an extreme case, but uh, as you say, as I said in the beginning, I don't think that the United States kind of inward lookingness uh, will uh, change dramatically even after Trump. The uh, <laughs> I don't go that extreme that the United States, because of this inward lookingness, get rid of their traditional policy of forward deployment of their military in Europe and in Asia. So uh, we shall sort of try to make sure that they will remain in the region and we shall ask the help of those countries in the nation, in, 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 in East Asia. Because they are the ones who stand to lose. And I'm sure China and Russia will make, take advantage of the vacuum of US withdrawal from the region. I don't think that will happen. So try to, you know, that's the reason why I say we need to have leverage. We need to have, have demonstrate to them that there is a sufficient reason why you remain in the region. That's uh, what I feel. Um, Paul Dib, uh, Strategic Defence Studies Centre. On two of your recommendations, CBMs, um, my experience with the ASEAN Regional Forum is that Japan and Australia, we've been working very close together yeah. on avoidance of maritime incidents, not just naval, but fisheries, coastal administration, and so on. However, on each occasion, the Chinese are a problem. Yeah. I, I welcome your comments on that. Secondly, your first recommendation on expanding national defense capability. I'd be interested to hear in what areas. In Australia's case, um, we are developing a capability as America's closest partner militarily in intelligence terms in Asia to have a very potent capability to deny China military operations in our region of primary military concern, the Eastern Indian Ocean, mm -hmm. Southeast Asia, South China Sea, and the South Pacific. To give you one example, we are the only other country in the world, other than America, to operate the Growler electronic warfare aircraft. They have the capacity to suppress all Chinese air defenses in the South China Sea. All. Can Australia and Japan do more together given that we're a quasi-alliance relationship, I'd like to see you part of the Five Eyes Agreement. Can we do more together in the context of your priorities for you building up your military capabilities? Um, I would like to respond this way. This, again, uh, There is a need for comprehensive <coughs> strategy. We talk about the confidence building mechanism. We talk about need for a lot more cooperation with China in specific uh, field of uh, economies and society as well. I talk about the need for expansion of Japanese defense capability. And you, I mean, you yourself are in the, uh, in the defense area and you must know 
how insufficient the Japanese capability, military capability is. We cannot shoot North Korean site by our missiles. It, it doesn't reach to them. We have no power projection capability. And I am not proposing that Japan should have aircraft carriers, but yet we may produce much more efficient kind of fleet which can be used in the region <coughs> nearby. So, uh, but, but yet, if we were to talk about each component separately, that may become the source of sort of, uh, you know, uh, source of suspicion. I think if we were to talk to Australians for the design, design, what is needed is a design, not a specific component. I think we need to address all the issue in a comprehensive way. What type of defense capability we would like to expand? What sort of uh, the precise confidence me building mechanism? I don't think ARF is sufficient for the deal. The, uh, uh, the uh, mechanism, because we have too many people there, yeah, too many. So uh, I would like to have much more comprehensive perspective uh, regarding the recommendation I made, not just piecemeal, but. Thank you. Now we're rapidly out of time, so with your understanding of the rest of you, we've got questions. May I ask you to try and have a quick chat with Tanaka-san after this? Um, and I'm going to give the very last question to a student in the audience who's put his hand up. Um, and make this really quick, so that we can... <coughs> so, um, uh, I'm going to have a of time. Could you speak up, please? Uh, there's been a uh, very uh, pronounced change in the orientation of uh, U.S. Uh, strategy towards both North Korea and China over, over the course of the Trump uh, presidency in uh, terms of uh, the means of how uh, negotiations have been conducted. There's been a lot of uh, friction between the four parties. So is that indicative of a, uh, a change in, uh, I guess, the uh, phase of the international order, so to speak? And what impact would that have on uh, building a different strategy towards uh, North Korean capabilities in uh, over the coming years? Well, uh, quite ironical. Uh, if I mean, I we normally say that all those uh, emerging powers they may be undermining the international liberal order, which has been created by the West, advanced nations centering upon the United States, it's now we see the United States undermining all the international liberal orders. It's not China. China may do so in a longer term, but the fact that the United States is undermining all those liberal orders will put China in a rather favorable position for the rest of the world. The Chinese may, may not be uh, necessarily bad. So that's point number one. Point number two, the approach President Trump takes, it's not based upon long-term strategy or anything. It is based upon his very sort of transactional instinct. I mean, I, he has never been in the public sector. He has been doing all this real estate job and all sorts of things. It's no wonder that he likes this transactional approach. But end of the day, this kind of impulsive, you know, taking uh, the, some type of leverage in order to negotiate with someone, let's create leverage. Let's sort of put a huge tariff on Chinese uh, Chinese uh, <coughs> product type thing. It's a leverage. And they negotiate from then. I don't think that will buy a lot of respect from the rest of the world. And the question of North Korea, this is the testing case. This is a testing case. I don't think Trump has, I'm sorry to say this, uh, the, about the president of uh, the, uh, the Japan's most important ally, 
but yet. I'm sorry to say this, I'm a private citizen, so I can all the recognize. Thanks. This is absurd. I don't think North Trump is interested in the precise process of denuclearization or making peace. But yet the approach he has taken in relation to uh, Singapore meeting, I think it is the right thing. And the follow-up would have to be done by the Secretary of State, Pompeo. He may have the sense of strategies, he may have the strong, uh, strong uh, disciplines in relation to how to deal with North Korea. So we I, I do personally hope that he will do the job, but yet I think Trump, President Trump's impulsive, transactional approach. I don't. I, don't <laughs> I wish we could end on a higher note, but, just, um, but uh, Tadakasa, thank you very much for the very vivid portrayal of Donald Trump having pushed the door open quite unexpectedly on the Korean Peninsula, and the reminder that this still leaves the rest of the region with a responsibility to walk through that door, um, and that it's not going to be Trump alone necessarily, or even Trump at all, walking through that door, but you know, the region acting in some sort of coordination and concert with a good sense of contingency planning and long-term vision. Um, thank you very much for this really wide-ranging, um, but also very timely, um, talk and, and I think I speak to everybody that we very much enjoyed this exchange. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.